Hey guys, it's Mr. Kennedy back with something on DNA technology. It's going to be a three-part series, so this is the first part. Um, we talk about DNA technology. We talk about the new advances that have come around in the world recently. Um, first thing you can look at is the pig down here in the corner. It has uh, yellow snout and yellow hooves. That actually comes from having DNA from an organism that leaks deep down in the ocean. That may even have the proficiency to glow in the dark at night time. Um, the mouse here that glows in the dark is the same way. Uh, I've even heard of glow in the dark hamsters before. Golden rice is uh, rice where beta carotene has been implemented in it to help produce vitamin A in people to eat it. And we've had gel electrophoresis, such as uh, over here in the bottom right hand corner where we used to find out people who have done certain crimes or who may be the father of something. And in the upper right hand corner you've got humulin which is um, insulin that's been made by E. coli uh, that people use that need insulin. So these are just things that which DNA technology can be used. And the crazy thing is that the human genome is enormous. We have all these different letters. We have 3.2 billion bases in our chromosome. That is just astronomical number. So if we can change the way these are arranged or add or delete things, it changes the outcome. So that leads us to bi biotechnology today. You know, genetic engineering is what we coined the phrase as being and is basically manipulating DNA. You know, if we want to engineer DNA to do a certain thing, we have some tools that we need to use in order to do genetic engineering, and that's what we're going to learn in this uh, series. Now, we need to do a little review about bacteria, first of all. Remember, bacteria are prokaryotic. They reproduce by mitosis, which is through a process of binary fission where they split. Um, they grow very rapidly, you know, a generation about every 20 minutes, so they go, can, can reproduce very, very quickly. Uh, there's more types of bacteria on Earth than anything else, and they're very, very diverse, so there's a lot of different genomes of bacteria. Um, now, when we talk about the bacterial genome, bacterial genome, remember, it is circular, not linear like eukaryotes. Um, it's haploid. It has only half the information. It's kind of like our sex cells are haploid. And it has a naked DNA. It's not wrapped around histones like ours is. Now, one more thing about the plasma, I mean, about the circular DNA. It's called plasmids, okay? There's small plasmids of circles of DNA that are found within uh, bacteria. And they are self-replicating. They make copies of themselves. And they carry extra genes, maybe like antibiotic resistance or something of that nature. And they can actually be exchanged from bacteria to bacteria through conjugation um, or other processes. And this allows for bacteria to reproduce or evolve very rapidly. So how can we use plasmids? Well, plasmids have come about that we use plasmids and we insert them into bacteria and then the bacteria actually produces what we want to produce. So let's say that we had um, a gene from a particular organism that we wanted right here in red and we took our plasmid and we cut it and then we injected that gene into the plasmid so you end up what we call recombinant plasmid. Recombinant means it has DNA from another organism and then we injected that into a bacteria. We transformed that bacteria, and it would have that plasmid with that extra information. As the bacteria copied that, it would copy um, the new gene, and, and it would make the new protein or whatever we wanted to make. So we take that, and we go to, um, this is the premise behind biotechnology. This is how we can make things that we want to make. This is how we make humulin, which is where bacteria make insulin. All right, what we do is we cut out the segment of DNA that we want from the desired organism. We put it into a plasmid from another organism, and then that organism will make the gene that's found within the entire plasmid, the recombinant plasmid. Now, how do we hook these two together? We use a ligase. You remember ligase from um, DNA replication. Um, DNA ligase is like glue, right? It's going stick to stick them together. So if we do this, how in the world do we get them cut? Because we don't, can't use scissors. 
Well, we use our restriction endonucleases, or they're called restriction enzymes sometimes. And restriction endonucleases are actually enzymes that are found within bacteria that are used to defend themselves against foreign DNA. If a bacteria gets invaded by a bacteriophage, that, di that bacteriophage injects its DNA or RNA into the bacteria. The bacteria can use these endonucleases to cut it up where it doesn't affect them. Um, scientists have learned how to use these endonucleases, these restriction enzymes, to cut DNA and RNA in places that they desire to be cut. Now, let me give you an example of what it means. If you look at these phrases here, radar, race car, madam, I'm madam, etc., they are palindromes. Palindrome means that it's the same thing no matter which way you go. If I read it this way, it is radar. If I read it this way, it is radar. If I read it this way, madam, I'm madam, or read it this way, it still reads madam, I'm madam. So that's a palindrome. Now, when we think about our DNA or RNA, our DNA especially, yeah, it runs anti-parallel. If you think about it, they're actually palindromes, right? Um, well, what a restriction enzyme does, it will have a certain binding site where it cuts. Maybe it always cuts between the G and the AATTC, so it's up in the upper right-hand corner. So if it always cuts here, my, my, cut, my, my cut saw, and always cuts here, it would cut where both of these are identical. Look, AATTC, AATTC, it cuts the C, cuts the C. So it, it, a restriction enzyme always cuts in the same place. So if this was bacterial DNA, it would cut it here. If it was your DNA, it would cut it in the exact same sequence. So if you put that bacterial DNA and your DNA together, those ends are going to fit. All you need is a ligase to hook them together. Now, these enzymes are named for the organism they're found in, like E. coli or different type of bacteria. And here's some common examples. E. coli 1, Hindi 3, BAM H1, um, small 1. Um, all of these are bacteria in which they found these new endonucleases that they use to cut now with or their restriction enzymes. Okay? Now, Here's just another example that shows you um, E. coli 1 was found in E. coli, and it was the first restriction enzyme that was found. It was found by these gentlemen here, Arbor, Nathans, and Smith. And they found out that it would always cut between a G and the AATC sequence. All right, so no matter what you put it into. Now, if you think about it, here's how it works. So if it always cuts there, you end up with this sequence here that leaves sticky ends, ends that are going to stick to other DNA cut with it. So if we took the gene we wanted and cut it, and then we took the chromosome we wanted to add it to and cut it with the same enzyme, it's going to cut it in exactly the same way, then we could take this piece and add it to this piece. And what we would get is down here. We get this part and this part, and they're going to stick together. And this would be a combined DNA or recombinant DNA. And all we need is ligase to hook it together. So here's the whole process put out, you know, you take out the yellow one, you pull apart the blue DNA, and you got a, a blue, the yellow in the middle, and then the blue again, right? So it's going to cut it in specific spots. Now, we mix these genes together so that genes produce proteins in different organisms or in different individuals, whatever we want, like human insulin, for example, can be produced by bacteria. Why would we want to do this? Because bacteria can produce it very quickly. And if they produce it very quickly, then we can get an excess of insulin, and then we can give insulin to people who need it. All right? Now, how can bacteria read DNA from me? Well, the reason is is because we all have the same genetic code. Remember, that's the common linking factor. This genetic code applies to everything. So that's how organisms can read some other organism's segment of DNA. Now, whenever we do, there's a couple things. You got, whenever we actually are doing this, you got a couple things you need to remember. Transformation is whenever we insert recombinant plasma, plasma that has DNA from something else, into a bacteria. That's called transformation. And what we'll do, we'll actually grow the bacteria that has this recombinant plasma in it. And then that essence is cloning the plasma, making a lot of them. And then they will all start working and make the protein, and that gives us what we want. So here's kind of the part in a nutshell. You know, we take the gene we want. We put it into a plasmid by cutting it with a restriction enzyme. 
we're going to, which transforms the bacteria. We grow a bunch of these bacteria, and then we're going to harvest the pure protein that's left. All right. So there are a lot of uses for genetic engineering currently. Uh, one would be how we protect insects from um, eating certain crops. Bt corn is probably the fi most famous genetically modified organism, or GMO. And it's when they have bacteria producing a toxin that keeps caterpillars from eating the corn, which that's pretty good. You know, farmers like it. They get more corn, make more money. Uh, we like it because there is food to eat. Um, you have an extended growing season, like with fish berries. Fish berries or strawberries actually have a gene from a flounder that prevents it from freezing. So you don't have to worry about frost. And then another one is golden rice, which actually has beta carotene added to it which is the proponent of making vitamin A. So this, there are some great uses of genetic engineering to make genetically modified organisms. All right, I hope this is a brief interview, um, overview for you, and I will talk to you soon.